From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode number 217, recorded on May 31st, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Also joining me from Glasgow, Scotland, Christina Naula. Hello, everyone. Um, it's nice tonight. It's still light, so we're in summer now. So I really love the long days that we get in Scotland at this time of year. We are without Dixon today. He's traveling somewhere. Undisclosed locations. I don't know where he's where he is. I'm sure he told us, but you know, <laughs> is he going to Iceland? Could that be? I thought he was going to Africa. Like I feel like I was helping wow. him out with some stuff. So I think he's somewhere in Africa at the moment. Okay. I thought he said well. India, but there we are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. all over yeah, we're all we're over very the useful. Yeah. He, he. <laughs> all right. Let's go over our case from TWIP two sixteen. Daniel, remind us what we have here. All right. Um, so I've started writing these down. So they're, they're now scripted before I would just remember them by memory. So maybe this is better. But uh, this is a case from one of my colleagues in Northwest China. Um, you know, and, and I think I mentioned last time um, that many years ago when I was asked to teach at Kunming University in Southwest China, I had this plan en route to the university that I was going to travel up to Urumqi, uh, to the beautiful Tian Shan Mountains and, and do a little bit of climbing up there. But, you know, I ended up distracted, ended up at a Tibetan monastery. And uh, I will tell those stories perhaps at uh, what will be TWIV 2000 or something or, <laughs> or TWIP 1000 if we ever make that. Um, well, here, here's the case. So a man um, right around the age of 30 presents with right lower extremity weakness, numbness, and issues with bowel and bladder function. Um, we get a little bit more history, um, and this was sort of emailing uh, back and forth with my colleague. Um, it turns out when he was a full few years old, he had reported dog exposure and had a lesion removed from his liver. What be that? Um, no reported dog exposure since he was young. I thought that was sort of interesting. Um, he is found to have a mass in the right upper buttock. Um, his white blood cell count is normal, but his erythrocyte sedimentation rate, his ESR, and his C-reactive protein, CRP, are elevated. <clears throat> he has a, uh, a CAT scan. I think we joked last time it should have been a dog scan, but he had a CAT <laughs> scan, which revealed this, this, this cystic um, or cystic lesions um, and significant destruction of uh, lumbar vertebrae 5. Um, but the, extra, the, the destruction really extends from L5 uh, through the sacrum and coccyx. And we're sort of left uh, wide open here, like what, what, could, what could this be and what are the recommended next steps? All right, why don't you uh, take the next two, Christina? You're muted. Hello. Sorry. <laughs> 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 she said all kinds of brilliant things. I was reading Sorry, her I was lips. saying I can't remember how to pronounce the name. There used to be a little um, pronunciation guide, so I'll probably get it wrong, but I'll try. Hawken writes, greetings from sunny Athens, um, Georgia. Yeah? Is it Georgia? I believe I don't so, know. Yeah. Sorry. Thankful for an... <laughs> That's Georgia. Sunny Athens, Georgia. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, I suppose I'm not local... Thankful for another brain-stimulating parasitic question. Heard China insists and went to Echinococcus multilocularis immediately, given the prevalence. However, I couldn't discount, discount Tinea canurus. Figure either way, treatment is surgical removal. Thanks, Hawken. Uh, uh, Hawken, that's the way it was. Ho okay, thank Hawken. you. Sorry, Hawken. 
I was just looking it up and I, I remembered it. Brilliant. Okay. Okay, and then Stefan writes, Dear Trip Team, hello again from Heidelberg, Germany. Today it is 19C and overcast, but occasionally the warm sun is coming through. Perfect weather for hikes around the castle ruins. Excuse me for my lengthy reply for the, chal- reply for the challenging case in the last episode. Today I will try to be more concise. The man's symptoms are consistent with equina coda syndrome, suggestive, suggestive of lower spinal cord compression. The hints provided would suggest cystic echinococcosis caused by the dog tapeworm Echinococcus granulosus to be the most likely parasitic cause, pending confirmation. As a child, the patient seems to have ingested eggs by food contaminated with dog feces, the definitive host. The human serves as a dead-end host and typically develops cystic lesions, hydatid cysts, in the liver with protoscolices inside. In normal intermediate hosts like rodents, these are eaten and develop into adult tapeworms in dog intestines. If removed surgically without thorough precautions, these intermediate parasite stages may spill into the abdominal cavity or be carried away hematogeneously to other organs, typically lungs, and cause metastatic cystic lesions. Rarely, such such as in this case, bones may be infected. He had exophytic, exophytic, Thick cysts, the one in the soft tissue of the buttocks, can resemble hydatid cysts. But in the bone, this is not always the case, as non-cystic tumorous growth in the bone leads to bone destruction. Diagnosis can be made serologically and by biopsy, pass positive membranes on pathology. Neurological symptoms may be alleviated by decompression surgery and other measures directed at stabilizing the spine, but bone echinococcosis usually is not curable. Lifelong albendazole therapy may suppress further progression of the disease. It would be interesting to learn under what circumstances the patient grew up, whether the diagnosis was made at the time of the initial surgery and whether a spillage event was noted. Stay safe and all the best, Stefan. Daniel. Raina writes, hi there. Thanks for the interesting cases. I've been newly introduced to the various twees, twixes, <laughs> and have been really enjoying them. The May 1st episode was my first listen to TWIP. Uh, the differential diagnosis from the listeners were quite involved and well thought out clinically. Veterinarian here and a long time removed from clinical practice. So here's just a quick Thought from the gut for fun. First twig was on the liver lesion and the early life dog exposure made me think of cystic echinococcus from E. granulosis. And although this can sit around latent for a while, it didn't, I didn't think it really fit with the clinical picture. I think neurocystosarcosis from tenia solium fits better. And Daniel answered my question about the patient while being from a predominantly Muslim area was not a practicing Muslim which makes it more likely in my mind that pork could be on the menu. Anything on imaging that could confirm high-dose praziquantil and or albendazole to treat for T. solium? If not, hydatid cysts are a lot more complicated to treat, I believe. Thanks for the challenge, Reina. And that's Dr. Dr. Reina Gunbaldson. And she is the veterinary program officer um, up there in uh, Canada. All right. Justin writes, hello, TWIP presenters. My name is Justin. This is my first time guessing for a case study, although I've been listening for several months now. I recently finished an undergrad course in parasitology, which I greatly enjoyed and now am going on to a master's degree in parasitology after my undergrad in biology at the University of Waterloo in Canada. Excuse me. (coughs) Ah. The weather here I'm, is. I'm glad I'm over here. I'm not going to catch your sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything. Uh, the weather here is mild and rainy at nine degrees C. The perfect weather for listening to the latest episode of this week in parasitism. My guess for the parasite in this case study is echinococcus granulosis causing cystic echinococcosis. The removal of a cyst from the patient's liver as a child may have been incomplete and led to the seeding of a second generation hydatid cyst in the buttock and spine. If indeed it was E. granulosis infection, albendazole and surgery were likely required. Thank you for a wonderful podcast. I look forward to listening to many more. 
uh, Tristina. Okay, Gillian writes, good afternoon from a rainy 6C Ottawa, Ontario. Here's hoping that all the rain means a lovely tulip season is about to bloom. We're apparently home to the largest public display of tulips. Who knew? Thank you as always for the interesting and engaging conversation and thank you Eyal for the excellent case in the previous episode. Leaving aside the epidemiology for a moment, as soon as you start thinking about progressive numbness, tingling, paresthesia or weakness in the lower extremities, I immediately focused on lower spinal cord degradation or compression. The inclusion of a large palpable mass hopefully it wasn't palpated too aggressively, in the buttock would typically lead me to guess metastatic tumours, especially with loss of bowel control. But knowing that this is a parasitology podcast, coupled with the frequent mention of this individual's exposure to dogs, led me to ask if there are presentations of echinococcus granulosus involving the spine, which indeed there are. In fact, although spinal hydatid disease is a relatively uncommon manifestation of infection with e-granulosis, it is relatively well documented in areas of high prevalence of the parasite, which include northwest China, particularly in the Xinjiang province. Coming back to this specific case, oh, I should have mentioned the reference, uh, so she provides a reference here. The paper by Yang et al. is actually a trove of information about spinal hydatid disease in northwest China and well worth the read, in my, honest, in my opinion. Coming back to this specific case, Yang et al. also report that over 70% of individuals with spinal hydatid disease have a surgical history of hydatid infection, which likely speaks to the origin of the individual's earlier liver cyst, as well as the large mass in the buttock. In cases like this, when the parasite invades the spine, there are no earlier clinical features outside of those associated with spinal compression, as the cysts grow extremely slowly through bone, resulting in presentation 10 to 20 years following infection, which matches the individual's reported dog exposure and the timeline for the first cyst being identified and removed. There is also the fact that Daniel was a very reticent to share the findings of the CAT scan, which leads me to believe that it is relatively diagnostic. And although an MRI would provide better visualization of the spinal infiltration, a CAT scan would likely show cystic bone destruction, which along with the patient's previous history of hydatosis would be telling. Definitive diagnosis would be the aforementioned MRI and identification of cysts removed during surgery, perhaps PCR if you're particularly curious of its lineage. Treatment would be cyst removal surgery paired with albendazole as an anti-infective treatment. In this case, although the individual had an earlier cyst removed, well, even if the albendazole treatment was provided and followed appropriately, there's nothing to stop reinfection if the risk factors aren't dealt with, which seems to be the case with prevalence of infection so high in this region. Two quick questions for the experts, if there is time. Even after all this time, I'm still not certain how to differentiate between cystic and alveolar hydatid disease in terms of presentation. I know that E. multiloculares infection is the more fatal of the two, and also infections infectious through those pristine looking northern streams. But could you maybe expand on why? Again, if there is time. Regarding ChatGPT, based on the predictive text nature of the tool, I wonder if you'd find a difference in a medical answer based on how you identify patients. For instance, patient versus individual versus infected person. It could be interesting to see if that changes the type of intervention that ChatGPT suggests. Thank you as always for such an interesting show. Gillian, who is a learning specialist and she provides us with a few interesting references. All right. <clears throat> John writes, greetings, Helminth heroes. I'm writing from Cape Elizabeth, Maine, where the sun has finally returned after a brief deluge. Taking advantage of the balmy 65 degrees Fahrenheit weather to mow the lawn while listening to TWIP, I thought it was high time to venture a guess at the case of the man from Western China with new cystic lesions in the bone. 
your clues of dog contact around the time of removal of a cystic liver lesion points me toward a diagnosis of a hydatid disease due to echinococcosis. Echinococcus, echinococcosis multilocularis seems the more likely species to metastasize to bone, but this may also occur rarely in echinococcus granulosis, hydatid disease, if the cystic germinal layer from which the broad capsule arises is not carefully removed at the time of surgery. I think it is more likely that the initial infection was due to E multilocularis, which can manifest as new lesions many years after initial presentation due to its slow growth. The CDC um, DPDX website, which I encourage people to check out, states that E. multilocularis is endemic in China and is most commonly reported in western and northeastern regions where the parasite is present in wildlife populations. I hope I have not embarrassed my teachers by being too far off the mark. I am taking the global health and humanitarian medicine course offered by Medicine Sans Frontiers and had the pleasure of joining Christina's parasitology lab training in Glasgow. I also enjoyed Daniel's globe trotting lecture cases around the world as part of the course. As a septuagenarian who seeks opportunities to stimulate synaptic plasticity and neuronal connectivity, I am grateful to all of you for your scholarly and entertaining podcast. Fingers crossed for next month's DTMH exam. Best, John. Wow. Remember him, uh, Christina? I do, actually. We went to the pub as well, so it wasn't just practical <laughs> work, but yeah, had some really interesting chats. Nice. All right. First, Vienna Parasitology Passion Club. Right. Dear hosts, we are writing to you from re very rainy Boston and sunny Vienna since the two halves of our parasitology club live on separate continents. But we always have a great time working on TWIP cases together despite time zone differences. In this case, a 30-year-old male patient presents in northwestern China with right lower <clears throat> extremity weakness. And I'll skip the description because we know what it is. When we heard this, it immediately made us think of cystic echinococcosis because we had recently seen a patient with almost who almost had the same clinical presentation as the patient from your case. The infection is caused by either echinococcus granulosis or echinococcus multilocularis tapeworms, which are mostly transmitted via the feces or urine of foxes and dogs. After infection with the larvae, hydatid cysts grow in the liver but can also be found in the lungs, the spine, or other parts of the body. Infection is oftentimes asymptomatic for a long time, but when symptoms occur, they may include weight loss and pain in regions affected by the cysts. In this case, the patient's symptoms most likely result from compression of nervous tissue in the vertebrae. Diagnosis usually made by ultrasound, MRI and CT scan and aided by serology, which can only confirm contact with the pathogen. The treatment of echinococcosis is complicated and may involve the PAIR procedure, puncture, aspiration, injection, re-aspiration, complete surgical removal of the cysts in prolonged antiparasitic treatment with albendazole or mebendazole. As always, prevention is the best intervention, which is mainly achieved by washing one's hand thoroughly not eating fruit and vegetables collected directly from the ground and avoiding contact with wild foxes and unknown pets. <laughs> who, who has contact with wild foxes? They run away. Oh, we <laughs> you know, I have to say, Vincent, um, so my parents a long time ago, my dad convinced the uh, executive of an estate that there was this area like on an island um, out here on Long Island that was really not worth very much. And, and we ended up um, living there for a while and it had foxes. And the mm -hmm. fox must, it must have been the people before must have fed because the fox would come to the screen door and it would scratch on the screen door requesting mm. food. Wow. wow. <laughs> so, there you go. yeah, some of the foxes out here on Long Island are a little too friendly. Okay. We have loads of foxes here as well, actually. And so many that there was a documentary a few years ago about the foxes in my neighborhood. So, hmm. yeah. Um, I, don't touch those foxes. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> they don't knock on the back door. <laughs> Okay, I think it's my turn. Christina. Yeah, Michael writes, yeah. hello, I've, I just discovered your show last week and I enjoy it greatly. Thank you for putting together such interesting discussions and making them so entertaining. 
Regarding the case of the week, given the history of dog exposure, liver, liver lesion excision in the past, current bone and soft tissue lesions, and the fact that we are discussing parasites only, therefore excluding fungal and bacterial infections that could also present in a similar fashion, my first diagnostic hypothesis, hypothesis is of echinococcosis. Other parasitic infection that could also present with bone and cyst soft tissue lesions and that should be included in the differential would be toxoplasmosis, cysticercosis, toxocariasis and sparganosis. Both echinococcus granulosus and echinococcus multilocularis are associated with dogs, i.e. their definitive host, can be found in Asia and are known to cause liver, lung, soft tissue and occasionally bone cysts. Toxoplasma can be seen both in cats and in dogs and can occasionally cause soft bone and soft tissue cysts, albeit, albeit bone cysts would be quite uncommon. Sorry, I'm stumbling over words tonight. Cysticercosis could present as bone and soft tissue cysts as well, but T. solium is associated with pigs and would be somewhat unlikely given the clinical history for this case. Toxocariasis is associated with dog exposure and it very rarely can be associated with spinal cord involvement, but it tends to present as solid masses instead of cystic lesions as seen on this case. Last, sparganosis, a rare infection caused by the cestodes of the genera Spirometra and Sparganum, is associated with dog exposure, has worldwide distribution and can cause both soft tissue and intraosseous lesions with associated weakness and numbness. Concerning the next steps and assuming only parasitic causes as this is TWIP, I would order serological testing for echinococcus by sequential combination of ELISA and indirect hemagglutination methods, followed by confirmation with immunoelectrophoresis and immunoblotting. If tests are negative, additional testings for other organisms could be pursued, including O1 parasite, serologic testing for toxoplasmosis and toxocariasis, antisparganum IgG antibody and immunoblot for T. solium assay. If tests are negative and the degree of suspicion for infection is still high, an FNA of the bone lesion with fluid analysis and or a biopsy of the soft tissue lesion could also be pursued. This could be helpful for the diagnosis of asparganosis. Best regards, Michael. And he's sending us a couple of pictures of a recent echinococcus case that he diagnosed by cytology. Um, I'm not sure, can we share those in the show notes? I think yeah, so. They yeah. look nice. Well, they haven't seen there are no identifying yeah. uh, materials. So. <laughs> That's true, yeah. So does it look yeah. good to you, Daniel? <clears throat> it's actually, yeah, I should, well, for those listening, driving around listening and not looking at these, um, one of the, you can actually, so I guess for those of us looking at it, um, look down at the, so we're looking at the first picture now at the bottom, right? You see this little hooklet thing sticking oh, out. Yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah, about a third. And then it's actually better in the next one. You can see um, um, sort of more of the center of the screen. You can actually see these um, hooklets. It almost looks like shark teeth things hmm. um, sort of in there. And that that's sort of the classic, but also even here on the bottom left, it almost looks like a skull X, right? Oh, it does, yeah. Yeah, 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 right. The head of the. Yeah. So it's really. I mean, these are these are great. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I worry about, right, is when you start putting a needle into an echinococcal cyst. Um, there's always the concern that stuff's going to spill out. Mm. Um, and by stuff spilling out, it's actually the the outside of one of these capsules is um, cells with like a really a stem cell potential for creating new ones. So um, that's why I think someone mentioned up above the concept of pair, where you puncture, aspirate, and then you're going to instill something that is going to uh, destroy uh, the cells. And then you're going to re-aspirate at the end or just surgically remove the whole thing. So be careful yeah. with them needles. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I remember... Many twips ago, you you saying how you shouldn't um, biopsy these, right? Because yeah, you have to you have to be careful. If this is a high dated cyst, yeah, know. if it is, I don't know. <laughs> All right, Daniel, you're next. Okay, um, and it looks like what is this? Is this some sort of a Chat GPT thing going yeah, on here? That's right. 
Yeah, looks like they uh, they put in, uh, you're a parasitologist and you received the following case description. What is your hypothesis? I like the fact that they already helped chat GPT by steering it down the parasite yeah. path. And so they describe the case um, and then they actually go ahead here um, and chat GPT is going with Echinococcus, Echinococcus, and more specifically alveolar Echinococcus. Um, and then... Um, it also mentions the larval stage of Echinococcus multilocularis, uh, mentions dogs and foxes, and then gives us five supporting factors. One, the patient's history of dog exposure, um, which is interesting, right? So, but, um, and then he says the prior lesion removed from his liver, uh, the mass in the right buttock, the elevated ESR and CRP uh, being indicative of inflammation and infection, and then the CT findings of cystic lesions. Um, and then um, chat GPT is going to say it is crucial to perform additional tests such as serology or a biopsy of the lesion. Um, chat GPT doesn't warn us about uh, <laughs> spillage or tracking. So... Um, and then if confirmed, the patient would require long-term treatment with anti-helminth drugs, potentially surgical intervention. Um, I think chat GPT may have missed the fact that this boy was having issues with bowel and bladder function. So you may not want to delay on a surgical intervention to... Uh... Yeah. All right. That was uh, Don in Australia, Sydney, Australia. Okay. All right. All right. James writes... I'm, a, I'm preparing a clinical integrative session for our first year medical students on parasitology. Just listened to your case yesterday and learned some cool stuff about malaria, doxycycline, et cetera. As a pathologist, I never prescribed doxy for anything, much less malaria. This case of a cystic lesion in a young man in Northwest China, of course, smells like Iconococcus hydatidis cyst disease with the dogs, et cetera. Google tells me that Iconococcus is common in Northwest China, associated with dogs and various herbivores. I've seen a case in Utah in immigrant Basque shepherds, though. This is far and away my favorite guess. Differential diagnosis of cystic lesion causing neurologic system symptoms. I'm guessing cystocercosis from tinea solium is not that likely, but possible, especially if there are a bunch of similar sized cysts. Amoebic abscesses does sort of tie up liver and soft tissue cysts. Paragonimus lung fluke does make cysts, but normally not gluteal cysts. Here's a real stretch. Squamous carcinoma from S. hematobium eating into the spine. Sometimes SCC looks cystic. Thanks for entertaining and educating me on my commute. James is a professor of pathology and microbiology at Rocky Vista University. Christina. Jason writes, greetings to it post. It is a warm 32 degrees C here in Accra as I write this. For the TWIP 216 case of the hair of the dog, I'm going with the diagnostic of cystic echinococcosis. Our patients with a history of dog exposure at an early age appear to have had a hydatid cyst surgically removed from his liver some years ago. That removal seems to have been complicated by the accidental spillage of daughter cysts into the peri peritoneum, which have evidently taken up residence as hydatid cysts in their own right. This secondary hydatosis might have been prevented with an intraoperative peritoneal lavage of a scolicidal agent such as a hypertonic saline and prophylactic administration of albendazole. Warm regards from Jason. All right, Marcus writes, <clears throat> Dear TWIP team, you are still best in show. Keep hounding us with these great cases. Here, it stopped snowing a week ago, and now we have a lovely sunny day with a warm 14C in central Norway. Sorry about the following digressions. Feel free to skip the first few paragraphs of differentials and go straight to the case guess. So my guess initially came to me when Daniel mentioned dogs and the removal of unspecified objects from livers. The attempts at backpedaling regarding the dog were not particularly effective and didn't end up changing my answer. Differential and clinical reasoning. Um, and then let's see where we go here. Before we get there, though, I think we should look at some of the ideas that didn't quite make it. I once learned that when making a diagnosis, you should always come up with at least three well-thought-out differentials with at least two horses 
and one zebra. <laughs> Though the zebra may almost never be the right diagnosis, the exercise keeps you on your toes when one does show up in your emergency room. First, the common noun parasitic alternatives. If we had no CT scan upon presentation, a lumbar prolapse with cauda equina syndrome is by far the most likely, followed by traumatic injury to or med compression of the medulla or medullary infarction. Um, I feel like we keep mentioning cauda equina syndrome, so I should, I'm going to digress here and explain what that is. Um, so if you, if you look at a spinal cord, um, you know, it's, it's basically a cord, but then it comes down and just like the tail of a horse, um, all the nerves spread out. So sort of picture that, um, so when you actually have compression right there at sort of the beginning of the tail, you can end up with impact mm -hmm. on your ability to to urinate, your ability to evacuate your bowels. And we refer to as cauda equina syndrome. Um, it also can be associated sensory loss, but this is a surgical emergency or a medical emergency. So just want to put that in there. All right, back to the email. Metastases seem unlikely considering his age. Uh, since he had some raised inflammatory markers, it's worth considering infectious causes such as discitis or osteomyelitis and always keeping... Um, TB and syphilis in mind, as well as other inflammatory illnesses like a strange presentation of Guillain-Barre syndrome um, or transverse myelitis. A more thorough neurological exam distinguishing from upper and lower motor um, neuron symptoms should be conducted. Now moving on to the parasites. Cystocercosis, medullary cystocercosis has been reported as well as medullary compression from extra medullary cystocercosis. Daniel made a point of the patient not being Muslim in a predominantly Muslim area, which may be relevant. Interesting, in Muslim countries with the kafala system, it is in fact often the masters who eat halal, who get cystocercosis, while their servants who eat pork do not. The servants have regular pork tapeworm disease, this being because they are infected by cysts from eating pork that will develop into regular tapeworms in the gut. The masters, on the other hand, are infected directly by eggs from human feces without going through the porcine stage, allowing for tissue migration, including migration to the CNS. Does not fit with the CT scan, though. Katayama fever, again, can cause cotyquina-like symptoms, though I would not give this finding on CT. Furthermore, the CNS symptoms of schisto are usually only evident upon initial infection on naive travelers, not in people living in endemic areas. And furthermore, Daniel denied any nearby sources of fresh water. Case guess, so I return to my first thought, medullary compression from hydatid disease of the bone caused by echinococcus granulosis, the dog tapeworm. Regular hydatid disease is a cystic disease, usually presenting with liver cysts containing scolices. Previously treated by surgical removal of the whole cyst, puncturing it may cause a massive immune response, anaphylaxis, and death. Pair procedure is currently preferred in most settings. Though rarely metastatic, the most common location for bone spread is to the spine and sacrum. Assuming a hydatid cyst was removed from our patient, if any small cysts and scolices were left after surgery and metastasized to bone, their growth would be slow. Decades may pass before any symptoms present, typically back pain, pathological fractures, and focal neurological deficits. The CT results are also consistent with this diagnosis. Serology with titers may be helpful if further confirmation is required. Removal of the cyst may be risky because of the anaphylaxis risk. Treatment should combine removal of affected bone with some margin, pair where possible, and systemic anti-helminths such as albendazole, since it is unlikely all microcysts will be removed in widespread disease. Any treatment could be considered palliative. Keep up the great work. Hope to see you all in Chicago. I think that's the ASTM and H conference. And that's from Marcus. <clears throat> all right. Kimono writes, I think that's you, Vincent. That's me. A great thank you for inspiring Maureen and I to share a properly splendid weekend together in New York City surrounding your TWIV 1000 event. So nice to see and hear you all in person. As for this month's case, I learned the most when I am forced to go down multiple rabbit holes during my researching and am therefore staying away from the AI query thing for now or until my teenage kids show me how. 
I'm postulating that the 30-year-old male with weakness, bowel, bladder dysfunction, and a remote history of liver lesions has a persistent and secondary spinal echinococcus granulosis infection. E-granulosis, one of the smallest cestodes, tapeworm that lives within the small intestine of the canine family, shedding embryonated eggs into the feces and thus afflicting any herbivorous animal or human that encounters such contaminated soil slash plants. These infections are endemic in any area where sheep husbandry and their dogs are prevalent, including Northwest China. Once eaten, the oncosphere hatches in the small intestine of humans and enters the bloodstream, reaching the liver via the portal circulation. It can invade most organs, although over 90% of cysts are found in the liver or lungs. Larvae synthesize a surrounding hyaline membrane, which differentiates into an outer acellular structure and an inner cellular germinal layer, which gives rise to protoscolices. Any spillage or rupture of cyst fluid can lead to secondary spread since these germinal layer cells have a stem cell-like ability to reproduce a full hydanted cyst, causing disease of newly invaded tissues, as in this man's spinal echinococcosis. These cysts grow at a slow rate of one to five centimeters a year and would account for his very delayed presentation now almost 25 years after first exposure as a child. Hydatid disease in the spine presents similarly to this man's at a ra rather late stage and with symptoms of pain, swelling, pathologic fracture of bone and or neurological compromise such as weakness and bowel bladder dysfunction if there is sacral nerve involvement. It's plausible that there was either leakage or incomplete excision of all daughter cysts during the, his childhood liver lesion removal. Perhaps the mass felt in his right buttocks is due to an expanding lumbosacral bony lesion. The elevated ESR and CRP, generally nonspecific markers of inflammation, could be response to a localized infection of the bone, such as osteomyelitis or a walled-off bone abscess. His normal White blood cell count may be due to the parasite's known production of immunosuppressive substances. Only after release of a cyst's antigenic fluid and protoscolices is there risk of a host's anaphylaxis response. For diagnosis, imaging using ultrasound, CT, and MRI can be helpful in detecting cystic lesions. On x-ray, you may see calcified cysts in tissues or destructive uh, lesions in bone, the latter which can be easily misdiagnosed as tuberculosis, bone cysts, and metastatic disease. Serological tests include ELISA to detect plasma antibodies to echinococcus and further detection of different echinococcus antigens by immunoblot assays. Microscopic identification of hooklets from an aspirate or sputum from lungs can also be diagnostic. Treatment comprises mainly a combination of surgical and chemotherapeutics. The PAIR technique of puncture, aspiration, injection, and re-aspiration using ultrasound guidance has replaced surgery for some patients. However, spiny bony echinococcus poses challenges due to the difficulty in complete excision, as we've discussed. Combination therapy often used with albendazole praziquantel. Um, I read that praziquantel is mainly useful in early disease, less treat for treatment of mature cysts, and the most scolicidal agents don't eradicate all daughter cysts. The likely, this likely explains the rather unimpressive resolution rates and significant relapse rates. In the interest of this young man's prospects, I'm hopeful that my diagnosis is either wrong or that there are newer treatments with improved eradication rates of echinococcus of the spine. In anticipation of the reveal and warm regards from a now gorgeously sunny Vermont kimono. Okay, does that bring us to Christina? It does, yeah. Chris writes, good morning, I doubt it, Twips. I was on a post-internal medicine shelf exam road trip listening to old episodes of TWIP when Dr. Depomier made an interesting comparison between high dated cyst disease caused by the dog tapeworm and cancer in TWIP 7. It is an apt comparison. If the cyst of echinococcus granulosis ruptures, two big problems can occur. Problem one relates to our body freaking out and producing a life-threatening anaphylactic reaction to the parasitic antigens. Problem two is far more interesting. Within the larger hydatid cysts float many daughter cysts that, if leak out into the body, can spread in a similar fashion to a metastasizing tumor. If the daughter cysts find themselves in a critical area, such as next to the sacral nerves, they can grow and physically damage or compress the surrounding structures, causing significant signs and symptoms. 
Tumors, depending on sarcoma or carcinoma, tend to spread via blood or lymph. Do hydatid dorthosis spread similarly or do they implant wherever they land? Additionally, does Echinococcus multilocularis, the fox tapeworm responsible for alveolar Echinococcus, grow dorthosis in humans as well or do the stem cells themselves have the potential to spread through around the body? I think what's going on with our patient, I think this is what's going on with our patient. He had a hydatid cyst removed many years ago, but many daughter cysts unfortunately leaked into his body during the procedure. Over the years, they have grown, causing what sounds a lot like cord equina syndrome or at least damage to important sensory and autonomic function nerves, leading to his presentation. Draining the existing cysts must be done with great care to prevent further spread of daughter cysts, with some recommendations suggesting treating with the PEER procedure, puncture, aspiration, injection and re-aspiration with a colicidal agent such as 95% ethanol. Some suggest adding albendazole to the treatment regimen. Thank you, Christopher Hernandez, and he's from the University of California in Berkeley. Daniel. Mark writes, Dear Twippers, I write to submit my diagnosis for episode 216. ChatGPT was not used in this analysis. <laughs> I believe the 30-year-old man in rural China is suffering from toxocariasis from exposure to T. canis eggs. According to the CDC, treatment is 400 milligrams of albendazole taken orally twice a day for five days. The key to my diagnosis was mention of dog exposure in the case notes. When he was just a few years old, he had reported dog exposure and had a lesion removed from his liver. A Google search for dogs, humans, zoonotic parasites identified hookworms and roundworms as possible causes. Hookworms are eliminated because their signs and symptoms Symptoms don't match the case description. Roundworms, aka Toxocaracanus, infect humans via swallowing eggs from dog feces. Young children playing with dogs and swallowing feces born eggs is a common vector. Worms can travel throughout the body, and many sufferers are asymptomatic. I speculate that this patient was treated for toxocariasis by removing the liver lesion. It appears this did not completely eliminate the infection. There could have been latent worms elsewhere in his body, or perhaps he got reinfected. The worm can live within muscle or bone, which match the case description, the mass in the buttock, and the destruction of bones in the sighted locations. Local surgery can compete with system-wide use of albendazole. Is there a good case study for treating symptoms and not curing the underlying disease? ELISA tests are available for diagnosis of toxocariasis. No mentions were made of these. Maybe they were not available in that region of China. Instead, the case notes indicate ESR and CRP are elevated. These are tests for inflammation and their elevated levels are consistent with his body's increased immune responses against an infection, likely a toxocara worms. <clears throat> Moving on, it was great meeting Daniel, Dixon, and Vincent at the TWIV 1000 celebration event. These case studies are very educational and transform TWIP into an active learning experience. Have you considered adding case studies to other shows? Here's an idea for a new microbe.tv show. Because, Vincent, you don't have enough going on. <laughs> Name that pathogen. Make a short show entirely about presenting a case, study signs and symptoms, and panelist recommendations for needed diagnostic tests, indication, identification of the disease, and indicated remedies. Mark. All right. Paul writes, Dear TWIP world citizens, many thanks to all of you for your fine work. Avid TWIP. TWIV listener, li newly listening to TWIP, writing from Petoskey, Michigan, on the shores of Lake Michigan's Little Traverse Bay, cloudy 47F with rain earlier. Quote, medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability. Dr. William Osler. 30-year-old man from Xinjiang, China, right leg numbness, weakness, etc. Differential, one, cystic echinococcus infection due to e-granulosis. Other considerations, since the clue, this is a podcast about parasites, isn't always available. Two, malignant sarcoma invading bone. Three, malignant osteosarcoma. Four, tuberculosis of the lumbar spine and sacrum with cold abscess. Five, plasma cytoma due to multiple myeloma. Very unlikely patient too young. Epidemiologically, cystic echinococcus fits well, very well as there are abundant sheep in Xinjiang combined with the history of dog exposure. 
The clinical course of a slowly evolving cystic disease over decades also fits. Next step, serologic testing for echinococcus. If confirmed, treatment albendazole for a number of months, injection of the cyst with protoscolicidal chemical solutions followed by surgery may be important in this case to forestall further neurological deficits. Caution that leaking cyst contents can precipitate anaphylactic shock. That's Paul Blanchard, MD, older general med internal medicine physician with no parasitic disease experience. Christina. Martha writes, dear Twippers, I hope I'm not too late again. I tend to get sidetracked when I start browsing for your cases. The, reason, the region of Urumqi was mentioned, which reminded me of an interesting book by Elizabeth Wayland Barber, Barber, The Mummies of Urumqi. I went looking for the book and I have come to the conclusion that I've loaned it to someone and never had it returned. <laughs> this has nothing to do with the case of the young man with weakness in the right lower extremity and pelvic floor issues. Um, he has a palpable mass on the right upper buttock and CT shows a mass encroaching on the spine at L5 and below. We are told he had exposure to dogs in very early childhood. The exposure is unspecified and a type of dog is not mentioned. He seems to have been too young to be out managing a flock with the aid of sheep dogs. We are also told he had a liver lesion removed in childhood. I wonder if the pathology report is available. The parasite that I suspect is Echinococcus granulosus. This tapeworm life cycle has the dog as the definitive host and the sheep as intermediate host. The dog becomes infected by being fed offal containing E. granulosus cysts from slaughtered sheep. Sheep become infected by ingesting the embryonated eggs shed in the dog feces. For definitive diagnosis, a fine needle aspirate could be done and rule out other causes such as TB or malignancy. I'm led to believe that anti helminthic agents followed by surgery is the consensus for treatment. I hope this finds you all well and that I have not again delayed too long in responding. Best wishes to all, Martha. Daniel. Right. Felix writes, Dear TWIP team, my last two guesses were sent in too late, so I hope this one finally makes it. When I went climbing in China, I learned the valuable lesson to always check the rented gear. We went on a two-day trip, and when we arrived at our camping spot and tried building up the tent, we realized that the rain cover was missing. Well, when it started raining in the evening, laying in the water was way too cold. So we just climbed through the rainy night, and at least we were rewarded with being the only ones at the summit by sunrise. Now to the case. My guess for the patient is Echina carcosis granulosum, especially with this history. If this wouldn't be a parasitology pat podcast, malignant causes would be on the differential list too. So what to do now? First, some blood work could be done looking for the elevation of antibodies. I think they have a certain threshold for acute disease. If my guess is right, Drainage or biopsy is probably too risky since there is acute worsening, neurological presentation, spinal decompression, and cyst excision should be done if the patient is healthy enough for operation. I really like the chat GPT emails. It's stunning what a non-medical meant transformer network can produce. Greetings from Germany, Felix. All right, Inga writes, Dear professors at TWIP, how grateful I was when I discovered your podcast about this topic that has had my passion for quite a while. I'm a young doctor from the Netherlands, but with an ever-growing interest in tropical medicine since having lived in Mozambique for several years as a child. I hope to be able to work in Africa myself one day when the time and my education and experience is ripe since my high school thesis about malaria. I've had a particular love for parasites. I feel like they always carry a story with them. Their life cycle can explain so much about symptomatology and somehow personifies them. While traveling in Africa between jobs, I had more time in my hands and wanted to get back into the hobby of studying parasites. You can understand my great joy when I found TWIP with you being equally or even more passionate and talking about all these fascinating diseases with such insight. I can say I binged quite a couple episodes before your latest one came out and I decided I would take my turn and give answering the case an actual try. Now on to the case, 30 year old male from China, <laughs> being inspired by the previous case and its entries, I thought I would start by giving <laughs> chat he a try, but merely for inspiration as we've seen its limitations as well. I specified China as the location, as your wonderful guest of last episode highlighted the importance of epidemiology in reaching a differential. 
chat GPT seemed quite convinced that the parasite we should be looking for is a tapeworm or cestode. Particularly high on the list was neurocystopsychosis. With a little encouragement, it also named Echinococcus, Spiromedra, <laughs> and as non-cestodes, Toxo and Nathostomiasis. My guess is that the complaints of this Chinese man are caused by the parasite, Echinococcus. What I'd like to do is confirm this using ELISA with the hydatid fluid antigen. A negative result is not enough to rule out the disease. People who have never had a cyst rupture may not have had enough antigens in their system to have created an adequate antibody immune response. The definitive diagnosis could be made using microscopic analysis or of, for example, sputum. Finding hooklets in the sample would confirm the diagnosis. Noteworthy is the strict contraindication of taking a biopsy of the cyst treatment, medical and surgical in, in intervention, uh, and uh, anti-helminthic drugs. Although I hope my guess of a kind of caucus is correct, I most look forward to learning from all of the reactions of the other participants and what you will have to say about it yourself. I absolutely love what you're doing. Keep up this great informative work. Greetings from a sunny day in Malawi where rainy season is finally over and we're moving into winter with temperatures around 26 Celsius. I'll be enjoying the last days of our stay in my beloved Africa. Kind regards to you all. Christina. Leon writes, Dear TRIP team, the Chinese patient who had a liver region removed during childhood and presents with a mass in the buttock and cystic lesions in the bone likely suffers from an infection with echinococcus granulosus. Infection with this tapeworm is typically acquired through contact with infected dogs and remains asymptomatic for years. Epidemiological studies have actually shown that the highest risk of infection occurs during childhood, which would, which would fit together with the patient's history of early contact with dogs. The ingested embryonated eggs hatch and develop into oncospheres, which predominantly migrate to the liver or lungs, but can also affect other organs such as bones, the brain and muscle tissue, forming an hydatid cyst that can grow to a size of 5 to 10 centimetres. The patient's right lower extremity weakness and numbness are likely caused by the destructive effect of the cysts on the lumbosacral joint, especially affecting the L5 spinal nerve, which is essential for leg movements. The cysts affecting the spinal cord could contribute to the issues with bowel and bladder function, although they could also be caused by cysts in the respective organs. The detected elevation in the inflammatory markers may may be a result <coughs> of the inflammatory processes occurring in the destructive bone or other affected regions. The cysts themselves, unless they rupture, do not trigger a significant immune response due to the immune evasion of the hydatid cysts, which explains the normal white blood cell kind. The description of the mass in the buttock also fits together with the potential size that cysts can reach. To, conf to confirm the diagnosis, additional tests such as ELISA can be performed, although imaging techniques, including ultrasonography, CT and MRI, remain the preferred diagnostic tools. In the case of the patients, proper imaging should find all cysts and the choice of treatment then decided based on the stage and location of the cysts. Minimally invasive procedures like the PEER, puncture, aspiration, injection, re-aspiration technique are often preferred for draining and treating the hydatid cysts. In some cases, surgical intervention may be necessary. Adjunctive therapy with albendazole is typically prescribed as well. Whether there can be anything done to recover motoric functions of his legs, I don't know, but I hope so for the patient. I hope this time I'm correct with my diagnosis. I have also considered infection with the pork tape worm, tinea solium, but the patient's history and symptoms fit better to echinococcus granulosus. I hope the patient is doing better meanwhile. All the best from Germany, Leon. All right, I all writes, dear sages of microscopic eukaryote life, greetings from Sydney and the land down under. The season of short days and long nights is almost upon us, and COVID is making the rounds again. I'm currently isolating with a case of COVID, which anecdotally is much milder than the previous time, about 14 months ago. Uh, 
a repeat offender here, I guess. <laughs> I wonder about the breadth of my immune response after receiving the main series, a booster, then boosted with the original Omicron, and now boosted again with one of the XBBs. On to the case. I found this one more challenging than normal, especially based on the lack of guiding details. The only clues I could tease out, Northwest China, dog, canine, <laughs> some penetration into the bone, spine, or the CNS. Also, I think there is a clear immune response based on the elevated ESR and CRP. Based on the lack of clues, I decided to take the epidemiological route. Initially, I thought of a nematode infection that got into the CNS somehow. However, I couldn't find any compelling literature. So finally, I landed on infection with Echinococcus granulosis, which is a tapeworm endemic to the area, which sometimes can infect the bones and is consistent with the dog clue. Um, lead as the dog is the definitive host. My guess in terms of the next steps is PCR blood test, possibly a stool exam. Not sure about the next steps as it seems that if this is rupture, it could cause an anaphylaxis shock and also lead to some sterilization of the host. Would love to understand more about this mechanism. I apologize for the disorganized email. Being hazy and foggy is still a problem. Many thanks as always for everything that you do. Stacy writes, I'm so excited to be back listening to TWIP. A Google search reveals high datidosis caused by egranulosis. Found several articles referring to patients with cysts in their gluteal muscles treated with antihemintics like mebendazole and albendazole. But it was the article prevalence in molecular characterization of echinococcus granulosis that made me decide to look no further. It says that sheep and cattle are a reservoir, which means the young man did not need to be in contact with dogs. Also, E. granulosis is prevalent in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, which is the northwest of China and whose capital, Urumiqui, is 100 kilometers west of Chanshan Shanxi National Park. I'm guessing that Daniel mentioned this to help with the location. Elevated ESR, CRP, and CT scan showing cystic lesions consistent with the diagnostic test used in the articles I found. I don't know what can be done about the young man's spinal cord injury, which I'm assuming is why he is now having extremity weakness, numbness, and bowel and bladder issues. But giving him either mebendazole or albendazole and removing all cysts seems like a good start. If I win the book, I'll give it directly to my daughter who plans on heading to nursing school soon as she completes her prerequisites before she goes. I figure I can peek at it as well. Looking forward to hearing the solution and how the young man is faring. I love your podcast, Stacy. And here's another Stacy. Stacy writes, hi, Vincent, Dixon, Daniel, and Christina. Today, I decided to finally test ChatGPT. I first did a series of questions about UTIs, then I switched to e-granulosis. This conversation is interesting to me because when I asked if e-granulosis caused damage to the lumbar vertebrae, it gave me two names for the condition, vertebral hydatid disease or vertebral echinococcosis. I looked up the first and sure enough, I found the following article and she references an article from, from Radiopedia. I only had two semesters of nursing school, which ended back in 2008, so I'm not able to detect incorrect information given by ChatGPT, but I can do further searches using its terminology. This is where I think I might AI might be really useful. I was lucky when I did my Google search yesterday had I used ChatGPT after I discovered e-granulosis. I think my search would have taken less time. I'm sending you the conversation since it is an example of how a layperson like myself would use AI to look up medical information. Thank you, as always, for this amazing podcast. Daniel. All right. Daniel writes, but this is a different Daniel. This is not me. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, TWIP team. My name is Daniel. Fine name. <laughs> My guess is the 30-year-old male has hydatid disease. I believe the cystic lesions in his spine, soft tissue, and previously in his liver are hydatid cysts acquired by ingestion of Echinococcus granulosis or Echinococcus multilocularis eggs in dog feces. Thank you for the fascinating case studies. I'm currently reading the book, People, Parasites, and Plowshares uh, by Dixon, and I'm on the chapter on tapeworms, which may have swayed my guess. I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Take care, Dan. Daniel. All right. That was a lot of guesses. 
Yeah, it was. Just a, that was yeah. good, right? I, w- I wonder yeah. what it is that, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe it's warming up and the Canadians are coming out. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we get we get a couple more guesses and then a chat. So, uh, should, Christina, shall we put you on the spot for starters? What do you yeah. think? Yeah. Well, I was thinking um, echinococcosis caused by echinococcus granulosus, and I was mostly based on epidemiology. Really, um, I had recently updated my own echinococcus lectures, and I was presenting a case study from that region. So that came to mind. So that would be my diagnosis and thinking about the next steps. I I, I think this man probably needs quite urgent attention. So um, maybe to um, decompress the compression of the spinal nerves because um, I don't know if, you know, that, well, not being a clinician, I don't know how reversible that will be. But I was also thinking how how challenging it might be to maybe remove a cyst from within the bone. I presume it's probably like almost burrowed in. Um, I I, I don't think it would be a cyst like you'd find in the liver, kind of a nice kind of little rubber ball shaped thing that you can probably remove much more easily. So I don't know. Uh, Definitely also start him on albendazole um, because that may be the only treatment option that we have. I'm not sure. That's me. Um, All right. And Vincent, what what are you going to do? You're going to pull out the knife as well? (laughs) Well, (laughs) I remember the hydatid cyst story you told a long time ago where you said, don't do the biopsy or can things can leak out and uh, seed elsewhere. And this the the uh, idea that this was so long ago was consistent with that. So hydatid disease, e, e granulosis. Um, I don't know what to do about the, the the spinal cord problem. That's that's beyond my pay grade, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, so I'll I'll describe what they did, and and so yes, we're going to end up confirming this is cystic echinococcosis. Um, you know, they were able to go back and get the records of the the liver lesion that was actually a hydatid cyst, which uh, we have some concerns about. Well, either how well that was addressed, or if there was some secondary process, but. Um, they, if you look at the CAT scan, um, this is, as I think some of our emailers put in, this, this is a, we call it medical or surgical emergency. Um, the longer that you have compression of the nerves, the longer that you have a lack of nerve function, um, just keeps increasing the potential of it not being reversible. So on the imaging, there actually is this pretty significant destruction of bone. Um, there's actually even a, a multi-cystic lesion in the abdomen. Um, mm-hmm. which, you know, is not initially apparent when they're like, on exam and by story. Um, so this, um, this gentleman undergoes um, surgical treatment, um, actually removing, um, you know, intact this whole area. Because as we talked about, you want to be careful here mm-hmm. not to spill things. And it really is interesting. I think one of our emailers, maybe it was even Kimono, talked about that inside these cysts, there's like an inner layer of cells. And these cells are actually, they have stem cell potential. They're also going to be these small dots water cysts in there. And any of these get out, it can trigger anaphylaxis, it can have a metastatic potential. So it's a really um, involved surgery that this young man goes through. Um, he then ends up um, taking albendazole, uh, the pretty high dose albendazole. Um, and he actually, I'm going to, this is a good um, a good outcome. Uh, this, this gentleman, I don't know what his job was, but um, three months later, he's back at work. Um, he has uh, most of his neurological function returns. Um, and actually, they did a follow-up um, scan, an MRI, um, and that showed no recurrence. So they actually really Great. successful jumping in with this. Excellent. Um, Love it. Yeah. Like the good outcome. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Let's give away a book. <laughs> we, we had okay. 22 guesses today. Let's generate wow. a random number. That would be 14. Who is number 14? That is Chris. I have a feeling that Chris has already won a book. So let's do another one. Just in case. (laughs) Just in case. If Chris hasn't, you can 
let me know, but I think you have, and I just haven't sent it yet. But the second one would be 15. That's Mark. Yeah. Let's say that. So let's call either Mark or Chris the winner. <laughs> And if it's, uh, you know, if it, if it out, turns you know? out the first one has won, we'll send out a second book anyway. Cause you, you feel bad, right? I remember we had yeah. like some competition and a friend of mine's a little bit dyslexic. So he called out like the wrong person. I was like, let's just give them both an award because you, know, you no feel problem. bad. <laughs> so, so send me a uh, Chris, Chris, or uh, if you won one, Chris, that's fine. I'll get it out to you. But let me know. Twip at microbe.tv. Uh, otherwise, we'll send it off to Mark. All right. I think that um, Christina has a, a little paper for us now, right, Christina? Yeah, so I'm actually quite glad it's a short paper. Um, that's quite a good coincidence because we had lots of really good guesses. So um, I uh, chose a paper. I'll give you the title first and then tell you a little bit about why I chose it. So this is the rapid and spontaneous postpartum clearance of Plasmodium falciparum is related to the expulsion of the placenta. And this is by Nso Anabire, Maria del Pilar Quintana, Michael Ofori, and Lars Veit. And um, they're based in Accra and Copenhagen. Um, Accra being in Ghana, Copenhagen in Denmark. Um, so, and this is in the Journal of Infectious Diseases and was published in February this year. So, a couple of episodes ago, we talked about female genital schistosomiasis, and I thought it would be interesting to maybe continue on the theme of women affected differently by parasitic infection. So, and this week, I've chosen a paper in the context of malaria in pregnant women. So, malaria in women is an important cause of adverse birth outcomes in endemic regions. And so we do, we do have means to prevent um, malaria in pregnant women, for example, intermittent, intermittent preventive treatment in pregnancy. But um, there's you know issues with drug assistance, uh, which may threaten the efficacy of this approach, but there also may be um, accessibility issues. So, um, in particular, this paper deals with um, not just any malaria in pregnancy, but placental malaria. So, and this can be present in quite a large proportion of pregnant women, maybe up to 63%. Um, and that really is irrespective of the symptoms that these women present. So, in endemic region, um, and so in areas with stable transmission of Plasmodium falciparum, parasites acquire substantial protective immunity to malaria in childhood. But this can be an issue. So first time pregnant women in particular become quite susceptible um, to malaria again. And um, what else did I want to say about that? So during a normal pregnancy in a woman not infected with malaria parasites, that kind of... Oh, maybe that's too detailed already. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, th I'll throw it a thing because okay. I think this is important. I was going to write maybe, into you know, the placenta knows. and how it's an anti-inflammatory kind of environment in normal yeah. pregnancy. But then when a woman has a malaria, there's a lot more inflammation in the placenta, which then leads to poor pregnancy outcomes. So... Um, I wasn't sure. Maybe that was too detailed. But go on, Daniel. Throw throw some other. Yeah, you know. no, I was going to say it's yeah for those you know this is sort of a a you know it shouldn't be but it probably is a niche area of knowledge about malaria is that there's two forms mm -hmm. right of malaria severe malaria in a in a pregnant individual and and one uh, tends to be. Uh, younger women, lower priority, maybe they don't have as much of this um, immunity built up over time. And um, the, this is the classic placental malaria where the parasites express a certain um, receptor and they actually really invade. So you end up with sort of a parasite richly infected placenta. And then there's the other kind which tend to be like higher parity women with more immunity where the malaria sequesters elsewhere. Um, but both times can be quite severe. Um, you know, this is a high risk condition to be pregnant and infected with malaria. So, mm. Yeah, so actually, so Daniel already mentioned kind of surface proteins that helps the parasites to sequester. So 
and so and this is really what this paper is about. So they're discussing a particular plasmodium falciparum erythrocyte membrane protein, um, mm. a variant. So this is a, a variable surface antigen that is displayed on the surface of the parasite. Um, actually, not of the parasite. I'm telling you, gobbledygook here is actually on the infected erythrocytes. And this kind of molecule serves as a, a an adhesing. Um, so it makes the erythrocytes really sticky and that's how they can um, get sequestered in, in um, vascular, um, you know, in small capillaries, for example, but also, um, as we see in this paper, in, um, in the placenta. So, um, and there's about 60 of these genes that we have or that the parasite has available to them, but it's usually only it's only a single variant that is expressed at any one time. And kind of switching from one to the other enables the plasmodium falciparum to evade host immunity. So, and actually, particularly with plasmodium falciparum, that sequestration into vascular, vascular tissues is so efficient that only erythrocytes infected with young parasites are present in the peripheral circulation of infected individuals. So, um, and, well, I suppose, you know, by sequestering in microvasculature, um, they will also, the parasites will also escape clearance in the spleen because if you have your blood circulating through the body, they will eventually go through the spleen and they will be um, sorted out and destroyed. Okay, so um, what else should I sell? Should I explain where where the parasite, where the erythrocytes go in the placenta? I actually looked up the placenta and I printed myself out a picture and what an interesting organ it is. Um, what do you think? I mean, I think that's interesting. And I think part of what this paper is also going into is the, um, so the P the PFEMP1 family and how like different variants are expressed in pre-delivery, right after delivery, how it shifts post-delivery. So it's really, it's really a very complicated situation, um, you know, during pregnancy, the different variants, and then how this, this um, affects, uh, you know, the outcomes that we're going to see and also the levels of parasitemia. Mm. So, so and actually in placental malaria, there's just, there's just one specific P. FMP1 variant that is uh, mediating the um, sequestration within the placenta, and this is called the VAR2 CSA type. And this binds specifically to a receptor that we only find in the syncytiotrophoplasts in the placenta. Um, I think, you know, if you wanted to go and have a look at the placenta, um, you'll find those cells surrounding the blood vessels, um, that kind of where, where the exchange of nutrients happens in the placenta. Um, so these parasites it exclusively um, sequestrate the placenta. And so in a non-pregnant woman, a, a parasite that would be expressing that surface antigen, this would not likely survive because there's no placenta where they can sequester to and they can get eliminated um, by the immune system. But um, that's not the case in women. So what I suppose on that background really... Um, well, I think another important fact that I forgot to mention before I go right into the result is actually that it has been absorbed, observed previously that plasmodium falciparum infection in pregnant women spontaneously resolves within a few days of delivery. And um, so the hypothesis is that this is because the parasites can no longer sequester in the placenta um, because there is no placenta and then the parasites can be cleared from the peripheral um, circulation. And um, so in this paper, they looked at a number of women in pregnancy. So they did a study in five health facilities in Ghana, where we have stable plasmodium falciparum malaria transmission with some seasonal variation. 
So they study authors, they recruited women that were near term to precipitate and um, they excluded any women who had maybe complicated pregnancies. Uh, most of the women had had received intermittent preventive treatment during antenatal care, um, but none of the women were treated for malaria during the duration when they were enrolled in the study, um, which was from shortly before birth until shortly after the birth of their babies. So, the infection was diagnosed by rapid diagnostic test and it was confirmed by blood smear, but also quantitative PCR. And the authors then went on to quantify the VAR gene expression um, and the data was used. So the VAR genes, that is that collection of 60 surface antigen genes that the parasite can express. And then they went on to... Um, to associate VAR2CSA expression with the clinical variables. So that's the background of the study. So actually had quite a high number of women consented to participate, 277, but of the women um, that were tested positive for malaria, and I don't remember that number, only 17 were ultimately enrolled. So that was quite a small study. And so, at the time of delivery, when the women gave birth, all women were positive by smear tests and also, and or by PCR. And then when they checked again after 16 hours after delivery, parasites were no longer detectable by microscopy in 14 of 17 women. And after three days, all but one woman was without detectable parasitemia and the results by PCR followed the same trend. Um, so this really confirmed quite conclusively that um, um, there is rapid and spontaneous postpartum clearance of parasitemia in women living in areas with stable transmission of this parasite. And then they also looked at the transcription of these um, surface antigens. Um, so, and they found that before the women gave birth, the primary transcript was indeed that um, placenta specific variant, where VAR2 CSA. Um, so, this was highly predominant in nine of the seven women, but also present in all the other women. And um, this antigen decreased after delivery as well, so in parallel to the parasitemia. And there was then a marked shift towards transcription of other of these surface antigen. Um, so, um, so overall, the data really is consistent with the selective disappearance of that variant um, with the infected red blood cells. So I guess that brings me to the take-home messages, unless, Daniel, you wanted to add anything. Yeah, no, I guess before the take-home. So, the, I mean, I think this is Im interesting and important stuff. One of the things we're starting to appreciate is how important sequestration is in malaria and malaria. Care. So you normally think about, oh, the parasites, they're floating around the blood. We do a blood smear, such and such percent. Um, we actually discussed a paper recently on the last recorded ID podcast, um, where when you look at drug resistance and sequestration, you almost have to divide people out. Those people where the parasites are sequestering are going to have potentially a longer clearance time because you're not really getting at the parasites. And here in the contest of pregnancy, you have a whole nother specific sequestration site. And here they're, you know, with, with a small sample size, they admit that uh, they're trying to get at the mechanism of this placental malarial sequestration. So the the only place these red blood cells can attach is in the placenta, right? That's where the receptor is. The VAR2 yeah. CSA expressing right. ones are specific yeah. for placental sequestration. So they're they're expressing a lot of this PFEMP one. They're binding mm -hmm. sequestering there, but it's sort of a phenomenon that we're seeing in people without a lot of pre-immunity, uh, yeah. without you know multiple parity. 
So for a few days, there are some circulating red blood cells in the women, right? With the, uh, the, uh, malaria inside them. So why don't they initiate a new infection? Oh, so these women, when they, when they give birth, when the placenta right. passes, there's like a huge amount of, I'll say, malarial, sequestered malarial parasites, which are now evacuated. And right. then there's no longer that sequestration site. So the women don't, they don't get completely cured, right? They're going to continue to live with a low level, but they're okay. not going to have sort of this sequestration reservoir. And I presume okay. they also return to their kind of pre-pregnancy immune status where they can maybe deal with that infection yeah okay yeah, yeah i mean part of yeah i mean part of this which is dramatic is, is once an individual particularly a you know first or second pregnancy delivers um there's usually a significant improvement mm. um i think maybe in the future i might share a case that i saw recently um you know and you're sort of why why is this young woman having such a hard time with malaria in a malaria yeah. endemic region yeah malaria is um is that variable mm. okay and there are malarias, P, P, plasmodia that sequester elsewhere, right? So, yeah, and that's sort of, I think they even point here, even in the context of pregnancy where there's a, you know, there's other things, not just the placenta, there's an yeah. impact on the immune system. Uh, you know, women who've had multiple children who maybe have a higher level of immunity, they're going to get peripheral sequestration. But you know what? We're also, uh, you know, individuals who are not female, not pregnant, are also going to have sequestration. And that's sort of a growingly sure. appreciated part of the malaria pathology. So I don't understand the evolutionary events that would lead the parasite to sequester in the placenta, which eventually is going to leave the host. <laughs> okay. uh, it doesn't make sense evolutionarily, right? Why? Because now the parasite is gone and it can't find a new host, right? So... I mean, it's great while the person is pregnant, right? It's a great place to hide while you can, you know? And then they, they, you know, it's like building a snow fort, Vincent, right? It's great for a while. Okay, the snow's going to yeah. melt, so you can't always stay there, but... Uh. <laughs> yeah, but you know, if you don't find a new host, that's the end of the line for you, right? So, yeah. you know, that's why herpes viruses periodically reactivate so they can go to a new host because there's no point in dying with the host that you're in, right? Because yep. that's not going to perpetuate the virus. So no here, evolutionary yeah, advantage. I don't I don't get it why this happens. But you're saying that some parasites do remain in the women, so yeah. the infection continues, correct? I suppose they could also I, change I the could, surface yeah. protein expression, you know, yeah. and then yeah. maybe sequester also. But I suppose, you know, during the duration of a pregnancy, there will be ample opportunity for transmission. Got um, it. Yeah. So, okay. so, yeah, I think, you know, the take-home message is um, we should probably learn more about sequestration because clinically this is really important. Um, yeah. So, yeah. All right. Thank you, Christina. Now it seems like Daniel has not won. <laughs> well, I'm trying to figure out two? which of the which should I present? Two cases? <laughs> should I present one case? Um, I'm going to present both, and I'm going to suggest <laughs> it might be the same diagnosis, right? So, so two for one. Does Daniel really have that many cases? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> gonna first we're going to talk about a gentleman who I actually I, I saw today again. I'll say that he's a gentleman I've been seeing before. And so this is a gentleman in his 60s. Uh, he provides IT support for a bank. It's all done Zoom, remote work. Um, he was referred to me because of some problems. Well, the problems he came to see me about is he uh, was having issues after his COVID diagnosis, September 5th, 2022. So what was that? About nine months ago now. So he's passed his three months, right? Still having issues. So this is a, a post-COVID fellow. Um, he had four vaccine doses. When he was diagnosed in September, he was treated promptly with Paxlovid, so kudos to his uh, physician. Um, he was feeling better. And then about three weeks later, he woke up with, with URI symptoms, started to feel crummy. Um, he felt bad for about a week. 
Um, then he starts getting a little bit better. He's still not completely better. Um, he sees his doctor, does a bit of a workup, uh, detects cold agglutinins. Not sure what to make of that. He's having some eye issues. He's referred to an ophthalmologist, um, ends up having intraocular pressure elevation, um, ongoing issues with sleep, fatigue, um, some cognitive issues. Um, I'm seeing him and things are starting to get better. So this is, you know, he he is improving. We're working on a bunch of things. Um, but I'm always trying to figure out, like, is there something special about this guy? So we start chatting some more. And he tells me that he um, he had an issue with a prior infection where it took him many months to get better. So I'm curious. Tell me the story here. So he reports that a few years prior to this current problem, he had an issue where he developed fever, a sore throat, um, tender lymph nodes in his neck. It was both sides as well as in the back. Um, this this whole um, sore throat issue uh, went on for about a week. And then he got better, but he had months of fatigue, sleep disturbances, not feeling well, right? So we're trying to figure out what may have happened back then. Um, I dig a little deeper. Any specific dietary things that were going on? Um, have you been exposed to any cats? Um, do you like to eat your meat rare? What's going on there? He saw several physicians at that point, and one of them did a number of blood tests um, about three months into that um, and uh, came up with the suggested etiology. Hmm. So that's case number one. All right. Now, here's case number two. Um, and this is a gentleman that I saw just a couple months ago, a gentleman in his late 30s. And we're only going to get the answer to this if Vincent starts asking all his probing okay. questions. So <laughs> be on your game, Vincent. Uh, and he presents to, uh, we like to say, to an ER at an outside hospital, an OSH, right? Um, before coming to see, you know, wherever we are, because that that medical centers ultimately, you know. Um, and so he he goes to this outside hospital before being transferred to an academic center in New York City. And the reason he ended up going to the ER there is he had the onset of left arm weakness um, on pointed questioning. He tells us that he had COVID about a month prior. Um, he felt like he had fully recovered. And then he, he noticed this weakness. Um, there, um, there is a report of a headache um, that preceded the onset of this weakness. So he's normally not a headachey guy, but he, he was getting um, headaches. Uh, the outside hospital is concerned with the presentation, so they triggered their stroke protocol, um, and they perform a head um, CAT scan, um, which reveals a hypodense lesion um, on the right side of the brain, um, but not consistent with the stroke. Um, a bit more history is obtained. Some further testing is done. Um, and based on this, the patient is transferred to us already on some sort of therapy. Hmm. So what what other questions? Um, yeah. We're going to ask about this second. <laughs> uh, well, both of them, do they have HIV uh, AIDS, Daniel? Well, so the, the first man in his 60s, no, he does not have HIV. But this second gentleman, yes, actually, we go ahead and he turns up to be not only HIV positive, um, but he's actually, uh, he's lost a bit of weight over the last several months. Mm -hmm. And we actually have a T cell count. So he's got a high viral load T cell count, which is less than 50. Oh, wow. wow. That was going to be my question, wow. but there we are. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. I think you've got enough I now. I think so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. All right. There you go. Thank you, Daniel. All right, that's TWIP 217. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIP. If you want to send us a guess for one of these cases, for both, TWIP at microbe.tv. If you enjoy our work, we'd love to have your support. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University Irving Medical Center, parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. Christina Naula is at the University of Glasgow. Thanks, Christina. Well, thank you. It was a fabulous recording again. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIP and Ronald Jenkins for the music. 
Now, whose turn is it now to do the sign-off? Maybe Might Christina, mine, right? So. I think so. Ooh, now the pressure's on. You have, been, <laughs> <laughs> you have been listening to this week's Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is parasitic.